interfaces and structures on the National Register of Historic Places, starting at the local level, gaining state level approvals, and then reviewed by the federal government. The theme of Pass Forward this year is From Vision to Action. This panel, including those involved at all levels of this process, will discuss what we need to do to create a National Register of Historic Places that reflects more fully the diversity of our nation. As you will hear, this panel is informed by the work being done by the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers to prepare a report titled, A Report of the National Historic Designation Advisory Committee, Recommendations for Improving the Recognition of Historic Properties of Importance to All Americans. It is also informed by other sessions that pass forward, including the session on integrity with Vince Michael, Sherry Freer, and others two years ago, as well as sessions last year on the National Register and sessions this year, including building diversity into the National Register, do we need another standard, which suggested a conservation standard that ties the treatment to the values defined by the community, and the session Wednesday on the revisions to Bulletin 38, The Power of Place, Traditional Cultural Places in the 21st Century, which suggested in part that integrity could be defined by the community whose culture is present in the place. Others have also made references to the importance of this work, including Sela Moda Casper, who asked how the National Historic Preservation Act is serving us the fundamental question in front of us. This session is titled Moving to Action because the preservation field has been discussing this topic for years, and yet frustration remains about the barriers to listing places of importance to communities in the National Register of Historic Places. Much of the frustration has been focused on the interpretation and application of the concept of integrity and what places retain integrity. After years of discussion, we are hoping that this session can identify actions that can be taken in the near term, the medium term, and the long term to address these concerns. Although many of the discussions over the past years have been focused on the concept of integrity and the interpretation of that concept, there are other fundamental questions that are related from the period of significance concept to considering entirely different criteria. I'm going to uh, quickly introduce this distinguished group of panelists who I'm very honored to have on this panel. Next slide, please. First, Holly Taylor is a preservation consultant, researcher, and educator. She began her career at the Keene County Landmarks Commission in Seattle, and in 2003, she established Pass Forward Northwest Cultural Resources, a consulting business specializing in cultural conservation projects. She is also a doctoral candidate in the University of Washington Built Environments Interdisciplinary PhD program, where her research focuses on the cultural significance of historic places. And she wrote an article that I found particularly useful for the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions titled Cultural Significance in Preservation Toward a Criterion Reflecting Community Values, which is on creating a criterion for listing in the National Register on Culture. Jordan Tannenbaum is the vice chairman of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and was an ACHP staff member from 1972 to 1982. A lawyer by training, he has also held senior fundraising positions at the National Trust for Historic Preservation and other organizations. He was awarded the Army's Legion of Merit Medal for his contributions to the Department of the Army's compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act. He also teaches introductory and advanced courses on historic preservation law and Section 106 compliance for the Navy's Civil Engineers Corps Officers School. Luis Hoyos is an architect and emeritus professor of architecture at the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, where he teaches historic preservation and urban design. He is past member of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and the Landmarks Committee of the National Park System Advisory Board. As such, he was national co-chair for the NPS American Latino Scholars Experts Panel and co-editor of American Latinos and the Making of the United States, a theme study. 
He is a current member and former chair of the California State Historical Resources Commission and a member of the board of directors of the Los Angeles Conservancy. And I'm pleased to say that he has also just completed service as a board member for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we greatly appreciate his service on our board. Chrissy Curran is an agency deputy director and head of the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department's Heritage Division. She serves as the state's deputy state historic preservation officer. Christy is the chair of the National Historic Designation Advisory Committee of the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, and therefore has played a key role in the development of the draft NICSPO report, recommendations for improving the recognition of historic properties of importance to all Americans. Next slide, please. Before the speakers began, I thought I would share a few quick thoughts. From my perspective, one of the conclusions I had from writing Why Old Places Matter is that places matter to people for a wide variety of reasons. And some of those reasons are included in the criteria for listing in the National Register, including history and architecture as provided in criteria A, B, and C. I am, however, a proponent of listing and saving more places through the National Register, which I think is possible even under the existing law. For example, although the National Historic Preservation Act includes the concept that the National Register of Historic Places is composed of districts, sites, buildings, structures, and objects significant in American history, architecture, archeology, span engineering, and culture, we have never developed criteria, a criterion around the idea of culture, and a cultural criterion is not included in the regulations. If we were to do this, it could broaden our thinking about how we apply the criteria for listing, as well as the downstream, downstream concepts of the period of significance and the application of the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties to projects based on their significance. I think this and other suggestions could help us to capture more of the reasons that old places matter to people. I'm using these images of Shaco Hill in Richmond, Virginia, both because of how timely it is. You see this article came out on October 28, 2022, but also because the, the listing of the Shaco Hill Burying Ground Historic District, which was listed in the National Register on June 16, 2022, suggests other ways to view significance and integrity. This is a historic burying ground for African Americans, which is adjacent to both a cemetery for white Christians and a Hebrew cemetery. Yet over more than a century from the 1870s through the 20th century, the African American cemetery was systematically erased by road construction, an animal shelter, a gas station, and other activities. In preparing the nomination for the National Register, the nominators, and I greatly appreciate their work, and the State Historic Preservation Office, which approved and forwarded this nomination, included the concept that part of the significance of the district was actually the history of that erasure, and that therefore the erasure was part of the integrity of the site. To quote the nomination form, while there is much to admire and enjoy in the well-designed and purposefully curated visible properties of the district, historical significance now resides equally in the partial destruction, often deliberate, of a highly meaningful, emotionally charged, and racially fraught landscape. This nomination seeks both to recognize its full extent and to expose the great disparities that have characterized efforts at preservation and historical valorization across this public space. Whether graves are marked with elaborate monuments or natural vegetation, that ground remains nonetheless both sacred and historic. I think this nomination highlights some of the issues we face as we try to update the National Register process and think of the actions we can take to make this happen. Now we're going to have each of the panelists share their ideas for action for about three minutes each, and then we'll come back and have uh, them talk about both short-term actions, long-term actions, and medium-term term actions. And I'd like to begin with Holly. 
So if we could turn to the next slide and Holly, we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so I'm gonna focus my initial remarks on changes I would like to see in the National Register regulations. Um, so for anyone unfamiliar with the regulations, they are at 36 CFR part 60.4, um, and they are the basis in administrative law for what we see in bulletin 15 on how to apply the National Register criteria for eligibility. So first and foremost, I think we need a new criterion for cultural significance. We have had the same criteria for historical, architectural, and archaeological significance for 50 years. And they are good, but not great, uh, because they don't always provide a path for recognizing places that are culturally significant. And by that, I mean historic places that are important to living communities today. I know some folks will say that we have guidelines for TCPs, traditional cultural places, and that's enough. Um, I appreciate the work that the National Park Service is doing on TCPs, and the draft revised guidelines that came out last week provide some good clarification, but it's still too complicated, and frankly, it's still too peripheral to the way that many of us think about the National Register. The TCP approach should be absolutely central to what we are doing as preservationists in the 21st century, namely focusing on historic places that are identified by community members, places that maintain community identity and express collective values. Those TCP guidelines have been around for 30 years. The preservation field just has not embraced cultural significance in the way that we could. Indian tribes have taught archeologists how to apply the TCP approach to places valued by tribal communities, and that's important. But many of us just have not gotten the memo that there are culturally significant places in all communities. And to bring the TCP approach from the margins of preservation to the center, we need a new criterion for cultural significance. Of course, many places will be eligible under multiple criteria, historic significance as well as cultural significance, for example. But the process is different for identifying and documenting cultural significance. People are the primary sources, people speaking from their lived experience about their relationship and attachment to places. So I've tried to think about the most targeted policy change that would have the biggest impact. And I think a new criterion for cultural significance is the change that we need. There are some associated changes that, I, that are also beneficial, adding use as an aspect of integrity, changing how we think about period of significance and significant dates, and changing some of the criteria considerations that present unnecessary barriers to listing. And I look forward to talking more about those ideas in today's session, thanks. Hi there, I think I am up next. Um, thank you, I'm uh, Chrissy Curran and I am gonna focus my remarks today on the four uh, main points that you see on the slide in front of you. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, I was fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to chair um, the National Historic Designation Advisory Committee's work um, over the last couple of years through Nick Shippo. Um, and the final report, which is, which is almost uh, hitting the streets, um, really, uh, the, what really jumped out at, at all of us um, through, the, through the process of putting the report together and the stakeholder outreach that we did was that responsibility for change lies at all levels of government, uh, local, state, and federal. And um, when, when you see the recommendations, you will note that um, there's a lot of them that say NPS should, NPS should, NPS should. And um, sorry, NPS, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, that, that NPS owns the program. However, that said, um, we're finding lots of things to do, uh, lots of critical things to do that can only be, be, be done at the state or the local level. So we are not off, off the hook, those of us at those levels. Um, and furthermore, that solutions should always emphasize 
the uh, optimizing public as access. Um, it's it's too uh, easy for for us to sort of conjure solutions that that then um, inadvertently put up um, barriers uh, with nuanced ar arguments that are too nuanced or um, too specialized and raising the cost. Um, and I and I also took away from this report that um, we really need to be looking at. Uh, at, at, at especially looking at public access for those communities that have traditionally lacked the resources and influence to preserve their historic places of importance. And that's gonna look different depending on way, what state or territory uh, you live and work in. Um, and that influence piece is really important. It's not just about participation, but bringing cultural diversity onto volunteer boards um, state and federal agency staff, and in the consulting community, um, it's it's really essential, and it makes a, a huge difference. Um, and and really thinking about leadership roles for uh, culturally diverse um, participants, um, and also this is always a tricky one. Don't be afraid of new legislation. That is sometimes the only way to get things done. You need to be very strategic about it. But what we heard over and over is in, in the report process is that, that that is something that will need to be done and there are ways to do it, whether it's rulemaking or regulations or actual legislation. So that's it for me, thank you. Hello, uh, Luis Soyos here. Uh, around uh, 2010, while I was serving on the State Commission in California, I was invited through the, uh, the Secretary of the Interior's office, uh, Salazar, to be part of a presidential study group organized on the subject of diversifying and modernizing the National Register. So you see this subject I'm just knocking around the halls of power for quite a while. That happily morphed into a four-year stint as part of the Landmarks Committee within the NHL program, which, as you know, reviews nominations. With things more or less running in parallel, we reviewed what you see on the screen. Uh, the slide you see has two versions, uh, separated by time, of the same building. McDonald Hall, a.k.a. Our Lady of Guadalupe and Mission Chapel in San Jose, where Cesar Chavez started to organize the local community years in advance of the grape strikes. In essence, where he became a leader. The time goes on, the chapel is moved, modified, modernized, but still retained the interior space where Chavez spoke. On the, <clears throat> on the right is a contemporary picture. The building was nominated for national landmark status for its association with Chavez. The, the discussion was not easy. That was not an easy meeting. There was a split vote turning on issues of integrity, of course, with a bare majority voting yes uh, due to its association with Chavez, not because of architecture. The building was approved as an NHL in 2017. Since 2012, the big picture has been the NPS has been making substantial progress under Secretary Salazar and with senior staff, um, including Stephanie Toothman, Tony Lee, among many others, towards diversifying the National Register and the NHL programs. Task forces were assembled, professional consultations were organized at various points in time and all over the country. Importantly, new theme studies were written in the aggregate resulting in diverse nominations being processed and approved with a substantial number of them uh, featuring vernacular designs, definitely not high art and definitely not high integrity. Then the big, the big action, um, a uh, NPS sponsored rewrite of the NHL bulletin in 2016 with the participation of a multidisciplinary task force led by an NPS historian, 
uh, Jamie Jacobs. The idea was to provide clarifying language regarding significance and integrity, calibrating the language, removing the often exalted qualifying adjectives that would only apply to major pieces of art and design. The rewrite, the rewrite in essence, would make it easier for resources with less than perfect integrity and with significance associated with underrepresented peoples to gain a foothold in the register, in the registers. The new bulletin, the new bulletin draft contains examples of vernacular buildings, tribal resources, and less than perfect historic districts. It has a wealth of, of, of uh, descriptive language in terms of guidance, case studies, et cetera. The work is 90% done, but got stalled after the 2016 election. The revised NHL document likely sits in the policy section at Interior. And there you have it. We all thought um, that once approved, it would be the model to be followed to be followed in modifying the language of the National Register bulletins. In my view, here's my action item. It would be great if NPS would continue the work and issue a new NHL bulletin to be followed after appropriate study and deliberation with a modified National Register bulletin and supporting studies. Thank you. All right, I guess I'm the cleanup batter and uh, uh, <laughs> excellent presentations, all my colleagues. Uh, so uh, I'd like to add uh, one other item to, uh, to my biography. In addition to working at the Advisory Council way back in 1972, which presumably makes me eligible for the National Register, a scary thought, um, I'd like to uh, just also indicate that uh, uh, since uh, that I was appointed to the council in 2016, along with my colleague um, Luis, and uh, am currently the vice chairman and acting chairman of the advisory council. And our main uh, business is um, ensuring that federal agencies comply with Section 106 uh, of the National Star Preservation Act as it relates to what we're talking about here. And we also have a very important job of um, advising the president and Congress. For those of you on matters uh, relating to historic preservation, for those of you who are not familiar with Section 106, and it does has have, as the register has, implementing regulations published at 36 CFR Part 800, um, Section 106 requires of the National Historic Preservation Act, requires that, age, that prior to the approval of any federal undertaking, and that's construed very broadly, that the federal agency um, take into account the effect of its undertaking on historic properties, and they're defined as properties that are on or eligible for the National Register, very important point, on or eligible, uh, and to afford the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation a reasonable opportunity to comment. I'd like to submit to you that Section 106, as I have practiced it and as I have studied it, as I teach it and as I know it, uh, is an inherently flexible process and it can accommodate a broad range of, of properties, properties of all different types, as, as the register accommodates, of course. Um, the, one of the areas that, that we are very uh, focused on and that we consider very important is giving due consideration to the views and expertise of Indian tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, and others with direct cultural connections regard, regarding the perceived significance very, very important. And I'd like to add in not only those groups, but any group, I would, I uh, have called them hyphenated Americans uh, that have a, that, that have a relationship to this, to the history that's being looked at. Um, it's very important that the community be involved and communities, as I just mentioned, and that they be involved in our consultation process, because through that process is where change happens and, and, uh, and, uh, resources can be preserved uh, and uh, and adaptively used. Um, well, we believe that it's very, very important to tell the entire, the, the whole story about historic properties and understand all the areas of significance 
that is critical because identification of the significance of a property is the first part of our four-step process uh, and it is essential to being better informed as to the effects on those significant aspects. Um, the, it is important to know also how the significant and qualifying characteristics uh, that qualify these properties for the register, either on or eligible, uh, could be changed. And it, and uh, and it's as I said, all very important that all parties participate in the review and understand why this particular property, this particular place, is important. Um, Properties that, uh, that are being considered can come from a variety of, uh, can represent a variety of different uses of different events, cultural associations, etc. cetera. As, um, as you may know, section 106 does not guarantee that a property will be saved. Um, uh, certainly and oftentimes as is in C2. Uh, and again, using this whole, this whole theme of flexibility, consultation process is flexible and very responsive to the variety of different consulting parties that are involved. Uh, uh, what, what we're trying to get at in that process uh, is what is most important to preserve and how might we preserve that. Section 106 recognizes our understanding of why places are important and it represents, as I said, that, that, that places can change over time. Uh, in fact, the, our regulations direct federal agencies to reevaluate properties given the passage of time, changing perceptions of significance, or incomplete prior evaluations, all of which we find. Where the full range of significance for historic property has not been articulated, doing so should be and is a part of the Section 106 process to ensure that the assessment is complete. As I mentioned, uh, we deal with properties that are not only on the National Register, but that are uh, and have been determined eligible. And that can be in, in a very simple way through what we call a consensus determination, where the federal agency and the state historic preservation officer or the tribal historic preservation officer agree that a property meets the National Register criteria and they will treat it as such. There is no obligation uh, in that in the 106 process then for there to be uh, navigation through the entire nomination process uh, to be able to con to to deal with the property through the section 106 review and consider a property rather through the 106 review. So uh, the other area that I think we'll talk about and that that we feel where you need to be flexible is in understanding and determining whether a property retains integrity. The formula for us is if a property meets one or more of the National Register criteria and retains integrity, uh, it is eligible for the National Register. But it is important to, to uh, remember that a property's integrity could be tied to practices, cultural traditions, or events that occurred there. And that might eclipse uh, what might be considered a usual approach to looking at the property's physical or architectural attributes. And we have a number of uh, things that, uh, that we feel can enhance that and can uh, make that a lot uh, easier situation to deal with and perception to deal with, which I will save to now, uh, as I believe we're time, it's time for us to get into our larger discussion. So thank you for the, for the time to spend with you. Thank, thank you all for those uh, great opening remarks. What I'd like to do now is I'm going to pose uh, the same questions to each of the speakers, and I hope that people will also respond to these questions in the chat so we can really get some thoughts going. And first, I'm going to ask each speaker to spend a few minutes talking about their short-term ideas for how to uh, improve the National Register process to be more inclusive. And I'm going to begin with Holly Taylor, and I'll also ask Holly to address a question uh, or a discussion that's happening in the chat around use, since she suggested that idea. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so my short-term idea, um, I would like to see a process for gathering public comments on revising the National Register regulations for eligibility. 
I give people, this is another, I wish the park service would, following on Chrissy's comments, give people an opportunity to have their say about what needs to change. Um, if the park service can't do that for some reason, maybe the National Trust or the Advisory Council can take the lead on that. Um, and just to, to uh, go back to some of the things I mentioned earlier, some of those ideas that I would like to have the Park Service consider, um, in addition to a criterion for cultural significance, I would focus on adding use as an aspect of integrity, meaning that for some places, continuity of use is one of the main ways that a place retains its significance. And anytime I talk about this, somebody always says, but you can't preserve use. Well, you often can't preserve setting either, but we still consider that a relevant aspect of integrity for some properties. Adding integrity of use would bring the National Register closer to how authenticity is described for World Heritage Sites, which include use and function among their attributes. I think thinking about integrity of use you know, shifts our mindset in some important ways. Integrity is not only about physical aspects of place, it also includes feeling and association. And it could be a more holistic way to identify the relevant qualities of historic places and whether or not those qualities are still intact. It reminds us that places do not need to have all aspects of integrity. Some places clearly do not have integrity of use. It may be more important for those places to have integrity of design. And it says that adaptive reuse is not always the answer. Use and cultural significance are closely linked. Keeping the shell of a place without sustaining its traditional use may not feel like preservation to a lot of folks. Like turning a working waterfront into a tourist amenity may not be preserving what's important. Um, in addition, the idea of replacing period of significance with just significant dates, um, I would love to see an end to the arbitrary 50 year cutoff. And I think it's, it's great to see again in the new draft TCP guidelines that almost every example uh, of, of non-native TCPs and native TCPs has a period of significance that comes up to the present. This is how we need to think about a lot of historic places. Um, their stories don't end. We can document significant dates and eras, but the idea that nothing is significant after an arbitrary point in time is just not productive. Um, and finally, in terms of short-term ideas, eliminating some of the criteria considerations that are barriers to eligibility, I think um, John Sprinkle's book, Crafting Preservation Criteria, tells us that the criteria considerations were mostly thought up in the 1930s, basically to keep places off the list of potential acquisitions for the National Park Service um, and to avoid controversy. So I don't, we don't need to keep these exclusions, especially for cemeteries and places of worship that are significant to underrepresented communities. I think these extra hoops do more harm than good in terms of preserving places that people care about. So those are my, my short-term ideas I'd like to see uh, brought forth for discussion. Thank you, Holly. Just to add one thought about yes. use that's a little bit broader than the criteria we usually work with is just the whole notion of authenticity and what constitutes authenticity. And I've seen some discussions around that lately and how much use contributes to authenticity. So Chrissy, may I now turn to you for your short-term ideas? And, um, and I'm also enjoying watching the comments in the chat as they continue. Thank you, Tom. I've got three I wanted to bring up. Um, and my first one has to do with something that SHPO's can do. Um, and again, my perspective is very SHPO based because that is sort of, that is where our report, um, that was sort of the DNA uh, of our report. Um, and we believe that, that SHPO's can target underserved communities with listening sessions and knowledge sharing to connect a community preservation goal with the National Register. But in some cases, uh, the National Register might not be the best tool for communities to use. But honestly, unless we go out and ask people um, what they are trying to accomplish, the best we can do is put our own filters on, on what we think they ought to be wasting, and that is not a really viable way to go. Um, and we think that can really be done um, at the SHPO level. Federal and state agencies um, need to encourage and respect unique local designation criteria in federal processes, such as the National Register and Section 106. Um, we 
often voter designation criteria um, stuck in the National Register. They face off of the National Register criteria. And if we're going to be open-minded about picking up properties um, that we don't want, we haven't traditionally seen in the National Register, those are going to be identified at the local level. The state CHIPOs don't know, and, and certainly the Park Service staff doesn't know. It's going to be up to local neighborhoods and communities to bring them forward. And they may be broader criteria. Chrissy, I think we're losing your sound a little bit. You may have frozen. Let me just, uh, hopefully you'll come back on in a moment, but let me just emphasize the important role that you uh, noted about the State Historic Preservation Offices. They really do play a critical role, obviously, in this process. And it's essential that some of this good work happens there. The other thing I would emphasize that you brought up is this relationship between the local designations and and how they feed up uh, to the state and federal, but then how the criteria also flow back and forth between the two. So while we're hopefully waiting for Chrissy to get back on, Luis, let me turn to you and ask for your short-term ideas about, um, about how to improve the national register process. Right. This, this turns out to be a very difficult question. Uh, the country is so big and, and local conditions vary so much. But uh, I think in, in, the, you know, in the abstract, uh, I would encourage localities to organize, um, you know, local communities to organize and to, and to participate in, in surveys and in getting to know exactly who they are, uh, what geographic extents they have, what, what resources they have. And to put it in an organized, in an organized way, in in, uh, in, uh, in the form of surveys, so that would be, be really good. I'm reminded of local examples, like here in Los Angeles, like for instance, Filipino Town. Nobody knew what Filipino Town was until people mobilized and uh, and 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 came up with evidence that it does exist. They do uh, occupy buildings, and they should be made a, a historic district. So. Um, how you do surveys is really interesting. Of course, everything costs money. So I would, I would think that localities would do well to pursue uh, funding uh, for, for surveys. And at the state level, obviously, the state could help by providing grants for surveys and, um, um, and maybe also by providing workshops to train people to do these surveys. That's as far as I as I got. Obviously, as, as part of my talk, and I'm I'm encouraged. Someone in the chat put that that the uh, revised uh, NHL bulletin will be released in a year. That's great news, and uh, maybe we can start thinking about revising um, the National Register bulletins. That'll that, that'll take years, I'm sure. Thank you, uh, Louise. Let me ask you a follow up question about surveys. One of the things we talked about in the uh, planning for this session was the professionals who do these surveys and what skill sets are needed. And do you think that should change from what we've traditionally done? Well, of course, you know, professionals exist for, for a reason. And, and I'm, I'm, as part of my work with the state commissions, uh, with the state commission, uh, we're always uh, mindful of who wrote the nomination, right? Was it written by a person or was it written by a, by a consultant? And admittedly, I think the, the, the standards for review, always subjective, are calibrated a little bit. I don't think you need to be a, a professional to do um, a survey. Uh, the um, here, here, right next door to me in Pomona, the Lincoln Park uh, District was very much a grassroots survey uh, that got over 800 households into a district and put on the National Register. So I, I think uh, 
the, the training such as it could exist um, could be done via workshops or via how to documents made available. So I don't think uh, you necessarily need to have trained professionals. Thank, thank you. Um, Jordan, why don't we turn to you for your short term ideas about what to do in the immediate future? Right. So, so just to respond real quickly to what to the question you asked about skills, let me uh, just say generally this would th these are good times for folks who want to get into history, historic preservation, uh, survey work, you you name it. With the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, there is a dearth of trained, uh, passionate, interested professionals, and so that's uh, another probably a topic for another panel, but something to keep in mind. I think as we look at, at sourcing that. I would say my short-term approach would be all centered around consultation. Uh, and uh, and that, again, let me hit hard on consulting with Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations. It's a theme that we, uh, uh, that we raise often in our consultations. They are the experts on identifying places of significance to them and assessing how they might be affected. We don't see enough of that, and I think that certainly has to increase as we move forward, again, in an environment where uh, we anticipate there will be um, a, certainly a growth in the need in, in regulatory activities insofar as preservation and other environmental areas are concerned. The second is to, that we want to encourage all stakeholders to be more involved in the consultation process. You have an opportunity to deal with directly with a federal agency. I think we don't see enough people taking it. This is a wonderful opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, to, to get your your ideas and your concerns across, uh, and um, and in looking at the community, community wide, for the community to express this interest, we would like to see more of that as well. Let me also say one final thing as uh, to the comment about changing the regs and changing the laws. Um, I believe, uh, certainly as an attorney, that. Um, Regulatory and statutory change can, in any political environment, any political environment, bring unintended consequences. And I think that you, my advice would be, to, uh, and you, Tom, might be able to um, to agree with this, uh, that you should tread lightly when you begin to look at um, at changing the laws or changing the regulations. Just a, a comment, and uh, and I'm done with my short term. Thank, thank you, Jordan, and I'll respond a little bit on the law, and I'd appreciate other people's <laughs> thoughts about it. Um, I do think there's a great danger in opening the process, but on the other hand, when the stars align, we've had some great changes to the National Historic Preservation Act through amendments mm -hmm. that continually broaden the impact of the act and yeah. broaden some of the things you're talking about, including consultation. So. Uh, I think, you know, as um, I believe David Finley put it, you know, it depends on when the stars align um, and they may may not always be aligned. But I certainly think there's a great deal that can be done without changing the law. And Holly has emphasized the, that culture is already built into the law, but we've never developed that criterion. Um, and it's not in the regs, although it's implicit in the way the regs have been interpreted, and particularly with the traditional cultural prop places, I'm now changing my terminology, and um, Sherry and others emphasized that yesterday. So go ahead, Luis, and then we'll come well, back to medium and long term. <laughs> I'm reminded of, of, of all those meetings uh, that, that, that went on to the to the retooling of the guidance of the guidelines for 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 the NHL program. So yeah, making a statutory change, we were told, uh uh, requires an act of Congress. You don't really want to do that. Um, but changing the 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 guidelines, the recommendations for people engaging in these programs is fully within 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 our purview. And could modify not just uh, the 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 often fraught nomination process, but could also, and I'm and I'm treading lightly here, could also change the culture within reviewing uh, uh, the review process happening at at, at Shippo's offices. Um, 
Thank you for that. Like, Go ahead. What? Keep going. Go ahead. Keep going. I'm. Uh, uh, what exactly are the calculations being made, given given the current the, the current uh, rules, uh, in terms of uh, what nominations are being are being uh, advanced, uh, how are they being assessed, in, in these in these um, in, in, in these um, highly subjective matters. I mean. Assessment so, of integrity is subjective, right? So uh, I think if you if you modify and modernize the rules, uh, that will trickle down and alter the culture in Shippo's offices. Well, one of one of the encouraging things I've seen throughout this conference is the extent to which people have talked about integrity as being defined by the community to which the resource is important. And that's really a watershed change in a lot of ways. I will also note that this conversation about changes to the law or changes to regulations or what we can do now with the other guidance really is sort of the short term, long term and medium term way of thinking about things. So let me use that as an opportunity to turn to the medium term. And why don't I ask you to combine sort of your medium term and long term um, action steps that you would take as a part of this, um, given the, the time that we have remaining. And the other, the last thing I'll end with is just as uh, the Park Service has uh, redone the uh, traditional cultural properties guidance, you know, I, I believe we're all looking at uh, at bulletin 16 and where where it needs to be changed. So let me turn to Holly next. Okay. Um, well, this this goes back to what Luis was saying earlier. I agree that um, the National Register process could be much more friendly to members of the public, but I also think we can expand. We can look at expanding the professional qualifications and training in the preservation field. Um, as a strategy to move toward a more inclusive National Register. And so everybody's familiar with the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation, um, maybe less familiar are the Secretary's standards for professional qualifications. And it's a really short list, right? There are standards for history, archaeology, architectural history, architecture, and historic architecture. That's it. So there was a draft revision 25 years ago that added anthropology, folklore, and other fields, but there was so much disagreement in public comments about the education requirements that the whole thing was shelved. So we still have the same short list from 1977 of who is considered a preservation professional who meets the secretary standards. So, and we still have sort of blinders on about what are relevant skills in terms of the full range of preservation work. Um, so this may sound a little esoteric, but I think it matters in terms of research methods, it matters, um, you know, it, it matters in terms of who is encouraged to come into the field, what kinds of properties are looked at. Um, so I'll just sort of throw that out there. Another, um, another th this was mentioned earlier, all the National Re Register bulletins need to be updated with or without the changes that we've talked about today. So, you know, broader range of perspectives and expertise among contributors are going to make those revised bulletins more interesting. Um, and I'll just, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Chrissy, have you rejoined us? Can you hear us and can we hear you? Mm -hmm. We're still not, we, we thought Chrissy had rejoined us, but that, that hasn't happened yet. So I will just take the opportunity to mention a couple of things that she uh, talked about and emphasized in, uh, in our pre-meeting. And one of them really was, the absolute importance of having uh, a diversity of people on uh, commissions and boards at all three levels of government. She she mentioned that uh, when she spoke, but she emphasized it uh, greatly. She also talked about the limitations of state historic preservation offices to make changes rapidly and how many of them are on two-year funding cycles. So um, I think these were all things we have to keep in mind as, as we move through this process. So let me, let me turn uh, to 
uh, Jordan and ask him for his medium and long-term actions, having already heard his position on not opening up the law. <laughs> okay, well, I've be become much more conciliatory towards in this area. Uh, so um, I have two medium long-term uh, recommendations to improve the survey information at the local and state levels Federal agencies rely heavily on this information in our Section 106 reviews. Uh, and so uh, that is an area that I've observed where, where I'd certainly like to see uh, some activity. Um, uh, you know, our, our places of significance to diverse communities included, that's something, again, that, that Native American, Native Hawaiian, et cetera, that, or other communities that, uh, that sometimes we find is left out. And our community values, as you just talked about them, are reflected in significant statements. And I think that's important. What are the community values? I see it tending more towards that area. Uh, so that certainly is important. And one thing I see that uh, we had a task force of the Advisory Council on this, on digitization, digitizing this information, the more digitizing that can go on, the better. They've done a pretty good, I, I'm not familiar with all the states. I do know uh, because the task force, we looked at in the task force what the state of Washington is doing. Uh, very impressed with that. Um, I, I the, muse the museum that I'm currently working for, the Holocaust Museum, of course, uses a lot of that. It, digitization is the wave of the future. That is something that has to increase and will be much more valuable to our uh, to our federal partners. The other is to be supportive and engaged in any efforts of the National Park Service uh, uh, or, uh, that they take to uh, to update their bulletins, as you just talked about. Uh, to provide guidance to them, um, uh, certainly on significance and integrity. Uh, I believe we did s uh, assist the NPS in, um, in revising Bulletin 38, and um, we're hopeful that they will look at other significant guidance in, these er in this, this area, and, and we look forward to working with it too. We, are, we feel very pleased with our partnership with the NPS and stand ready to help them in any way we can. So. Those were my two medium to long term uh, comments. Great. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Chrissy, welcome back. Um, I'm delighted to see you back. And let me give you the opportunity to talk about your. I, I combined the medium term and long term um, action items. So let me ask you to go. Thank you, Tom. And I'm so sorry about that. Um, totally blew out our internet. Um, so my midterm and long term combined um, really like to see the National Register or the National Park Service take the lead and the fifteen year rule to better allow for contemporary cultural significance. Um, also I think cost is a barrier as we as we've been, been hearing. Um, and the more nuanced the argument to have something listed, the more professional help is needed. Um, that help can come from from SHPO staff or community consultants with financial support, um, some sort of subsidization. Mm -hmm. um, and for the NPS bulletins and guidance for non-professionals, um, you know how to make the case for the significance of a place is event based or business based, um, which is the case for many neighborhood places. Um, and long term kind of goes back to the changes in legislation um, regarding tribes. Um, there is an inherent systemological injustice to register that. I've heard that over and over again in our stakeholder um, outreach boundaries, ownership, being beholden to state and federal agencies to certify that their places are important, public access to their information, None of that is now um, sovereign over. So, also the National Register doesn't uh, provide protection. So we need to look out what the National Register framework and not the framework is doing that. We heard that from our friends in Australia um, that they are doing that. Um, protecting indigenous sites and places of cultural memory that have a minimal physical signature may require separate legislation. That's Thank awesome. you, Christy. Thank you. You're still a little bit difficult to understand, but I think we caught most of it. And I just want to highlight when we 
uh, talk about the importance of the state historic preservation offices. We also include the tribal historic preservation offices, and I don't want that to be to be missed. Let me ask Luis to bring us home, and then I'll just have a couple minutes of um, of closing comments. Well, very quickly, I uh, in the medium term, I I visualize, I hope that uh, after surveys comes awareness and that communities will, will, will know what they have and they'll, they'll be um, incentivized to write nominations, hopefully by applying for, for grant funding to organizations like the National Trust. Uh, I, I remind people that this session is being uh, uh, supported by the African American Cultural Heritage Fund. So money might be there, you just have to access it. And I don't like to, following the thread of, um, of what happens in, in, in SHPO's offices and boards and commissions, I absolutely agree. Um, we have to be, I, I don't know if I want to use the word vigilant, and I'm not pointing fingers, but um, boards and commissions function much better if they have a diverse composition. Uh, you know, if there's a person that's handling uh, the social sciences, there's a person uh, qualified to deal with tribal issues, things go so much better. So I'm, I'm very um, disappointed when I see a commission that's not diverse, that, that might be handling information or making determinations without without the appropriate face knowledge. I don't want to end on a, on a downer. Uh, medium I, term, I hope that we get a lot more diverse nominations. Thank, thank you, Luis. And I don't think it's a downer to emphasize the importance of having diversity with a lot of different meanings of what diversity means on the boards and commissions, because then that expertise is there. So uh, it's, it's really great. Um, uh, Holly, Jordan, Chrissy, any final comments or responses? And, um, and, and then I'll just do a quick close. I'd love to just respond Holly. to something that um, was a comment, couple of comments that were made in the chat about looking at properties associated with BIPOC communities that had been turned down for designation, either at the local, state, or national level. And I, I would encourage folks to take a look at a project that I'm involved in with many colleagues in the Seattle area. It's called Beyond Integrity. We're looking at equity and preservation. And we've had a series of fantastic interns who have looked at many years worth of data of nominations to our Seattle and King County Marks commissions. What has been designated what has been turned down because of integrity issues or other concerns. So we're actually starting to gather that data and kind of do an audit on local practices. So that may be a model for some folks wanting to do that at other locations. Thank you, Holly. That's a that's a great way to end. And I just want to thank the panelists for their uh, great comments and their thought that, that went into this discussion. Clearly, we could have a much longer conversation. And I also want to thank all the participants for the amazing information that's been included in the chat and for the questions and dialogue that's happening there. Um, and obviously, we have a, a, a lot more to do. But uh, I really appreciate people focusing on specific action steps that we can take. So we'll take this information and see what we can do together to work on this. Thank you all again. And uh, I really appreciate your participation in this important panel.